कर्पूरगौरम करुणावतारम संसार सारम भुजगेन्द्रहारम सदावसंत हृदयारविंदे भव भवानी सहित understand this. It is in the very nature of human intelligence that if you do not know something, if you realize you do not know something, because most people do not realize that they do not know, <laughs> if you realize that you do not know, it's very natural for your intelligence to seek to know. It doesn't need a guru, it doesn't need a scripture, it doesn't need somebody to introduce that to you. It is in the nature of your intelligence that you wish to know. There are lots of experiments to show, even mice, if you leave them in a place, within two minutes they will research everything <laughs> in that space, for their own reasons, of course, for survival reasons. They, you know, inquire into everything around them to find out how the place is. Human intelligence goes beyond survival. So naturally, human intelligence seeks to know many more things which does not concern our survival. Yes, we are concerned about survival till a point, but once that's taken care of, we cannot rest. We want to know more, endlessly more. The more we realize we do not know, the more the longing to know. So this longing to know, when it finds a very intense expression in the form of seeking, we call this spiritual process. Or in other words, the basis of spirituality is a realization that I do not know. But the moment you say, I'm religious, you refer to yourself as a believer. When you say you're a believer, what you're saying is, everything that I do not know, I will make it up. How I make it up? Whose help I seek to make it up? Maybe varying from person to person, somebody makes it up because of… with spiritual assist… with scriptural assistance, somebody makes it up with the assistance of a priest or a pandit or a guru or whatever. But you seek some authority. You kind of make a compromise in your life that instead of truth, you settle for an authority as the truth. Spiritual process means truth is the only authority for you. Authority is never the truth for you. So these are two different aspects unfortunately spoken in the same breath most of the time. So I would say spiritual process is far closer to scientific enquiry. See, even the fly is trying to investigate me. <laughs> I'm… trust me, I'm not <laughs> investigating, I mean, I'm just inquiring. No, no, I And I not, wish I was the size of that fly. I did not anyway. uh, use the word investigation in a negative way, nothing wrong yeah. with investigation. Yes, totally. Investigation means you want to know the truth. Right. Maybe it's done a little forcefully like a fly. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming to you now <laughs> That's all I get these days <laughs> No, if you get to fly, what more? Uh, yeah, so well… <laughs> You manage pretty well, I have a… I have a fear of turbulence, <laughs> so flying is not really on my top three things to do in life. So, spiritual process does not demand belief because belief and spiritual process cannot go together. Spiritual process is a constant inquiry to… it is a way of sharpening your questions so that they dig deeper and deeper, not into something else but into yourself, the nature of your existence. Because the nature of human existence is such that in our experience, the only thing that you can experience is yourself. You actually believe you're experiencing many things, but you only know everything the way it happens within you. You do not know any other way. Even now if you see these people, it looks like they are there, but actually you know them or you see them only the way they projected in the firmament of our minds. There is no other way. There is no other way for you to experience this life except the way it happens within you. 
Now, spiritual process is a constant effort to see that the way that it happens within me is not a distorted vision, that my mir mirror is not a wonky mirror, it is a plain mirror, that it shows me things the way they… way things are, it doesn't distort anything because of my thought, because of my emotion, because of my attachments, because of my identities, because of the philosophies and ideologies that I identify with, I can distort my mirror. Now I deprive myself of all that so that I have a plain mirror and I get to see everything just the way it is. This is spiritual process. No, well, thank you because that's <laughs> always been a continued dilemma and I believe that the word spirituality is sometimes misused. Uh, where there's not a grave understanding of what it really is. And as you said, that the I don't know is… has immense power. And I think acknowledging the I don't knows of your life really means everything. And I wish people would start doing that because according to me, sometimes delusion is the biggest disease that plagues humanity <laughs> when you're not aware of your own self. No, there are… Uh, there are all kinds of idiots on the planet. Yeah, yeah we work with many of them. <laughs> but we must understand this, in the very nature of who we are, it is like this, if you do something stupid today, tonight your intelligence will bother you, why did I do this? This is the nature of human intelligence. But the moment your stupidity is either scripture endorsed or God endorsed, you can go on doing the same idiotic thing with enormous confidence. It gives you confidence without clarity. Confidence without clarity is a disastrous process. If you do not have clarity, at least you must have hesitation <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that's true <laughs> Well, I have to say that, you know, I was… At, I, I want to personalize this a little bit. I was at a crossroad about thirteen years ago and my father was very critically ill. And at that juncture of my life and before that, Religion was organized in my life, it was what was taught to me, it was what I thought the right thing to do was. Um, when he was in his last stage, there were things suggested to me uh, which were to me now completely ridiculous, including going to a certain temple and feeding a cow of a certain color and, uh, you know, and doing a certain ritual at home and all those things that one did without even thinking. Because as you said, when you spoke about the idiots on this planet, I was definitely one of those in that stage of my life. But sometimes you reach a critical stage where you seek any kind of desperate measure and you try to kind of hold on to any hope that even something that is advocated to you that goes against your grain of intelligence or thought. To those people, what is your advice? Who have reached the end of their rope and are hanging on and holding on to anything, be it religious, be it spiritual or be it an unfounded piece of advice. See, for all this, uh, the fundamental basis of these kind of aspirations or actions is because people are just shit scared of life. Why is it so? It's like this. Suppose you sat on a bicycle on stand, you know, and started simply pedaling for fun but it came off the stand and started rolling. Anxiety, faster, fear, very fast, terror. The fundamental reason is, but someone who knows how to ride a bicycle, the faster it goes, the better it is. But for someone who does not know how to ride a bicycle, the moment it moves, terror will happen. So the fundamental thing is just this, you have been given a very complex and sophisticated vehicle to pass through the process of this life, which is human mechanism. There is body, mind, emotion, energy, many dimensions to it. Essentially, this human mechanism is a very complex phenomenon. Now, you are going at it, you are trying to walk through life without understanding a thing about the vehicle that you are using. Every time it moves, there is terror. If it doesn't move, you want to die of boredom. If it moves, you're terrorized. There is no way out of it. Tell me one thing, tell me one thing that human beings are not suffering. If they are poor, they suffer poverty. If they become rich, they suffer taxes. If they are not educated, they suffer that. You send them to school, endless suffering. 
they're not married, they suffer that, you get them married <laughs> Yeah, that was… I was heading to that next <laughs> I, I didn't say a thing, they are the ones <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's an extreme validation of the institution <laughs> So, tell me one thing that they're not suffering. So now somebody develops a philosophy, life is suffering. You know, there are philosophies like this. Now it's not about life because you've not even touched life yet. All that you're dabbling with is right now your own thought and emotion and it's going crazy. So you are on a bicycle that you don't know how to ride. But this is not just a simple two-wheeled bicycle, it's a complex machine. You don't know how to ride. You don't know how to manage your thought. You don't know how to manage your emotion. All these things, human experience is essentially happening from within you. Whether it's misery or joy, agony or ecstasy is happening from within you. At least what happens from within you must happen your way, isn't it? The world will not happen your way. But the problem now is what happens within you is not happening in your, your way. What's happening in your mind is a dream. Even your dream is not happening your way, that's the problem. The problem is not that your life is not happening your way, even your dream is not happening your way and this is the source of their misery, but they think it's marriage, they think it's children, they think it's poverty, no. Fundamentally, it is just that you are not happening the way you want yourself to be, that's all your misery is. So, even if you want to learn to ride a bicycle, this is a simple basic machine. It needs a certain level of attention and involvement, otherwise you can't ride a bicycle. It takes an enormous amount of intent to want to ride it, otherwise it's quite impossible to ride a bicycle. After you know how to ride it, you can let your hands off, you can close your eyes, all these things. Pretty much like marriage Because <laughs> like wheels are turning but going nowhere oh. at times. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't like to make that <laughs> statement because for many people they've gotten somewhere with marriage. Yes, we'd like to find out where but <laughs> but on another forum. Uh, <laughs> when you speak about suffering, uh, uh, Sadhguru, it is definitely something that I believe that self-pity sometimes is like a, a, a luxury spa, you know, it's somewhere where your comfort lies. Self-pity is, I believe, the most indulgent emotion and gets you nowhere but makes you feel really good for a certain period of time. Uh, what is your take on something like self-pity? How is being pitiful a luxury? I don't understand that. It becomes, you know, it, you, feel, you get great solace in that emotion for a, <laughs> for a short period of time. Self-pity can be the most happy place to be at, like self-indulgences. See, there are many ways to achieve peace, happiness, well-being. This happens. Shankaran Pillai, in his… he was a little abusive husband, verbally abusive. So he would rant at his wife, but she was always peaceful, never reacted. One day in the middle of his raging rant, he stopped and he asked, whatever I say, how much ever I abuse you, you are peaceful, how do you do this? She said, I clean the toilet. He said, what? Cleaning the toilet, how does it make you peaceful? She said, I use your toothbrush <laughs> So, don't fall onto that <laughs> uh, You're giving lots of people ideas <laughs> So that's not a… <laughs> that's not a relationship, it's a revenge story <laughs> No, you can achieve peace and solace in so many different ways, I'm saying <laughs> <laughs> Which is what you said, to draw from within, to find your solutions. Because the most exciting line that I read was that… that… that, you know, life can't touch you, can't scratch you, it can't harm you, you know, you create your own energy in your own life. You know, life… you're… you're in this universe, you've been brought into this world and it's in your control what you do with it. You know, life has nothing against you. What you achieve and what you do is a result of your own actions, your feelings, the pleasantness that you create within yourself. Which to me was a very moving line because it… it… it very… it simplified a very 
extensive and expansive feeling of anxiety, fear and all the turbulence that humanity goes through on a daily basis. To me, three pillars of our existence are pretty much, you know, family, fortune and farishta, which is what I believe result of God, religion, everything else. When we talk about family, Sadhguru, there are few things that have always intrigued me and I seek answers or rather validation from a higher energy such as yourself. Um, it's like I've always questioned why there's an organic distance between a father and son. Why there is always that angst in that relationship. And I'm sure there are many in this house uh, that have experienced that emotion in their own homes, in their own environment. Where do you think the origin of that distance came? Because every generation makes the same mistake, <laughs> which means they're not learning at all. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when we say family, you know, in Italy family meant crime. Crime? Yeah. Mafia was always referred to as the family. Family. Yes. So in a way it's a kind of crime. It is the most basic institution in the making of a society, but it does not mean you must remain basic because this is a biological identity that we have. Biology is a reality, we can't deny it. Obviously, this was in some way, at least to a certain extent, our parents gave this to us, one part of it at least. Today, the way it is, the way it looks is essentially because of them. Well, it was given to them by somebody else, that's another point, but to us it was given by them. So it's a biological identity. This limiting oneself to one's biological identity, identity for an entire lifetime is… Uh, is a crime because it creates so many things. In this country, this country has suffered a lot from a long time. Just now, you released the Mahabharat uh, video. Entire Mahabharat is family problem. It is Dhritarashtra syndrome. We are still suffering. My son is best, no matter what. Even today, we are suffering the same thing. My son is best and he should become the king no matter what. It's not Some just… Some sons haven't managed very well <laughs> So. Family is a basic identity that we are born with. It's a wonderful thing when you're a child because without that family support, you wouldn't be who you are today in many ways, okay? With all due respect and regard and great respect for the family because human creature is born in such a way that as soon as you fall out of your mother's womb, you're not ready to get up on your feet and do things like other creatures. It needs a, a long gestation period before a man becomes a man or a woman becomes a woman. There is a long period which… where the incubation of family is most important and vital, there's no question about that. But you're supposed to grow beyond that identity, but a whole lot of people just never grow beyond that identity for which they suffer and sometimes if they're born in certain places, they make the entire nation suffer <laughs> Uh, you are supposed to grow out of that. As a child, it's most vital that you're identified with the family. But as an adult, you're supposed to grow beyond your biology because biology is the most basic identity. One has to grow beyond that. So having said that, is it necessary that every father and every son has to have some kind of angst? It is not about father and son. It is just two men being accommodated in the same home. <laughs> when you were eight, ten, your father was godlike. So this problem started after you became fifteen, sixteen, when you want to be a man and there's not enough space. This big man is occupying too much space and that man thinks this is my space and who's this? They can't recognize each other as father and son because now there are… there is no father and son, there are two men in the same house and there's not enough space. This happens not just in human families. Every creature, whether it's an elephant or a buffalo or whatever, in every creature's life, this happens that 
there will be some friction and either the younger one goes out or the older one goes out. This happens everywhere because this is not a problem between fa father and son. This is two men trying to share the same space and the same woman called mother to one and wife to the other. Two men. Well, that certainly breaks a very strong myth that this country is operated with because the problem was always meant to be two women <laughs> uh, <laughs> in the same house and you just changed it on his head, which I believe is true because I believe the problem lies in the fact that two men can't be accommodated. No, it also happens between women in a different way. Yeah. But uh, women have a way of uh, covering their frictions in certain way. They do it in a certain way, in a feminine way. Yeah. Men will do it in more <laughs> head to head on. Yeah. <laughs> head butting is the man's way. Woman's way is different. She will do it differently. But the friction happens. And I feel it's always like the, you know, the mother energy of the house that sometimes has to bear the brunt of this tussle in a family. Um, it's also the other thing that, uh, an offshoot of that thought is that I believe very strongly that the people you love the most, you kind of tend to dump all your anxieties, your angers, your, your fears, your insecurities all onto the, that one source that gives you the maximum love and the one that you love the most. Why is it that we as a human race tend to do that, tend to lumber all our negative emotions on our most positive light source? No, no, because if you try to dump it on someone on the street, they'll smash you up. Yeah. <laughs> So, is you're, you're choosing a, uh, a safe place. But is that always fair? First of all, it's not fair for you to carry anxieties and angst and angers and problems within you because, see, if I try to torture you, you have some defense against me. Either you will fight me or you will run away or you will do something, you have some kind of defense. But if you start torturing yourself, this is the most helpless creature. Right. No, most defenseless. I'm telling you, even an unborn child, if you poke like this, he responds, he defends himself in his own little way, yeah. okay? But this one is completely defenseless. When you start poking yourself, this is a completely defenseless life. So the worst kind of torture, the lowest level of mind is one who tortures himself. But they always think they are the highest level of people, I suffer for everybody. <laughs> you bloody suffer anyway <laughs> If there is everybody, you will dump it on them, otherwise you'll simply suffer <laughs> Yeah. People come to me and say, Sadhguru, I can't bear with my, you know, my mother-in-law, this is impossible. <laughs> my husband, after all her son, my wife, oh, she's <laughs> terror for me. My boss, he's not even human. Like this, it yeah. goes on. I tell them, you come, don't worry. I'll give you a nice place to stay, I'll give you good food, yeah. nothing to do. For your life, I'll take care of you. Only thing is, I will make some random checks on you. When I check, you must be joyful. If you're miserable, I don't believe in feeding misery <laughs> Right <laughs> <laughs> So, you leave them in one place for twenty-four hours, you will see how they will mess themselves up. So when you're alone, if you're miserable, you're obviously in bad company <laughs> Now you're thinking, because of this person I'm suffering, because of that person I'm suffering, just stay alone by yourself, without any entertainment, without texting, without television, without reading, simply sit in one place. Joyfully, let me see, most people can't stay there for five minutes, believe me. They are not on Facebook, they are not on Twitter, they are not this thing because they have something to say or because they have fallen in love with the world, no. If they stay alone, they'll go crazy. That's a fact. What is… I mean, sorry to break that train of thought, but what is the… the solution to that kind of feeling of… of just not enjoying your own space? Because we have not looked at how human mechanism works. It is like… You have a super sophisticated machine. This is the super super computer. Out of this is the machine which dripped supercomputers, isn't it? Right. I'm asking, have you read the user's manual? <laughs> That's all it is. 
The entire yogic system is just this. This is not a philosophy, this is not an ideology, this is not a religion, this is not a teaching. This is just the user's manual, how to… how your body should sit, how it must breathe, how the mind should be, how the emotion should be, how the energy should be, what are the things you can do with it, how should you keep it so that this will function at its highest possible level. See, the cell phone companies have been doing some research a few years ago and they found only seven percent or only three percent of the people, no, ninety-seven percent of the people are using only seven percent of the cell phone's capability. We are not even talking about today's smartphones, we are talking about the dumb phones. So ninety-seven percent of the people are using only seven percent of a small gadget. If that is the fact, how much do you believe are people making use of this tremendous gadget? Just on the surface because they never bother to read the user's manual. If you tell them this, they say, Sadhguru, can you give us the user's manual? It's written into you, you have to spend some time with this. This was written by the source of creation, not by me or you, isn't it? You must learn to read, the problem is illiteracy. See, suppose you are… you do not… you have not learned the alphabet. Well, you have learned English alphabet, let's say I'll give you a Tamil book. You look at it, does it make any sense to you? You don't know the alphabet, it doesn't make a… doesn't mean a thing to you because you do not know the alphabet. Now, this is the problem that in today's society, in modern education, we have not even brought fundamental literacy towards how to read this book. Because we've never read this, by accident we are managing it. If you manage by accident, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. One moment you're happy, next moment you're miserable, one moment you're peaceful, another moment you're in turmoil. I was… Uh, <laughs> you know, I'll cut the long story short. I was in Tel Aviv and somebody came and greeted me, Shalom. I said, what does that mean? He said, this is the highest way of greeting. I said, that's your opinion, but what does it mean? He said, no, 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 this is really the highest way of greeting. I said, all right, but what does the word mean? He said, it means peace. Then I said, why is peace the highest way of greeting unless you're born in Middle East? <laughs> in South India, you come up to me in the morning and say, peace. I will ask, what's wrong with you? <laughs> I'm saying if you deprive yourself of something for a long time, suddenly it becomes godlike. If you've not eaten for ten days, even if God appeared, what's the prayer? Food, of course. So, once you deprive yourself of fundamental things, I'm saying fundamental things because to be peaceful and joyful is not the ultimate goal of life. If you want to enjoy a meal, you must be peaceful and joyful. If you want to enjoy a friend, you must be peaceful and joyful. If you want to enjoy a walk on the street, you must be peaceful and joyful. If you want to enjoy simple things that you do in your life, you must be at least peaceful and joyful, if not ecstatic. So it is a f most fundamental requirement. This is not happening. People are saying this is the ultimate goal of life. Even so-called spiritual leaders are saying peace is the ultimate goal of life. Such people will only rest in peace. <laughs> For those, I mean <laughs> In what I believe um, surrounds us all is urban angst. I think that seems to be terminology that comes out of, you know, mental health solutions, etc. And that seems to be rampant in, in many parts of the world now, including now slowly penetrating even in India, when people deal with mental health issues like depression and anxiety um, and those kind of which seek certain chemical imbalance issues that are told to them. They're by making you look very pretty on the screen. How do they do that? They're not doing that to me, huh? They're making my what? My… <laughs> look at yourself there. Am I looking pretty on yeah, screen? Yeah. Okay <laughs> well, They're not doing you. that to me. <laughs> you're actually… you're looking stunning to me, sir <laughs> Stunning is another word for shocking <laughs>
<laughs> well, uh, I was trying to find another adjective to <laughs> counter that, but back to me and my mental health issue. <laughs> I really want to know, it's such an order of the day today, you know, everyone seems to kind… It's almost… and I hate to say this with any… Um, and I don't say this with any kind of disrespect to people's personal circumstance, but I almost feel like today it's talked about like it's almost a fashionable issue, where I think it's a very serious issue. When people talk about mental health issues like depression and anxiety and seek uh, counselling, uh, to sort those issues out and then the diagnosis at times is chemical imbalance and medication is given. What… and then your… your… well, I know you hate the word philosophy but all your teachings are definitely about finding yourself and seeking that pleasantness from within. But to those who are not strong enough to achieve that and seek this assistance, what is your take on that? Let me correct one more thing in the question. This is… this is not a teaching. This is just a technology. I am right. just giving some people simple methods with which they can work. If people are coming for a teaching, they're frustrated with me because every time they come, they leave more confused than ever before. If they look… if they're more confused, in a way my job is done because <laughs> my entire work is to get them out of silly conclusions <laughs> that they've made about life. And confusion means you're still looking, you have an active inte intelligence. Conclusion means, what is the conclusion of your life? Hello? What is the conclusion of your life? You don't know, let me reveal the suspense to you. Though as a filmmaker, he won't tell you till the end <laughs> I will reveal it Sometimes to you. Sometimes we don't even know what happens after that, so <laughs> many of us are confused souls when we make movies. So. The conclusion of your life is you'll be dead. You think something else is going to happen to you? <laughs> you'll be just dead, that's all is a conclusion. So every time you make a conclusion, in some way you die, you need to understand this. You kill something of yourself every time you make a conclusion. This is you in a state of committing suicide in installments. You may call this religion, you may call this philosophy, you may call this being socially whatever, but fundamentally you are committing suicide in installments. This is why when you look at a child and yourself, you are less alive than a child. As you grow up, should you become more alive or less alive? Unfortunately, most adults are less alive than children, isn't it? You must be more alive, but unfortunately you are less alive. Maybe your physical agility will go down with age, but your aliveness need not go down. Aliveness is going down because you're continuously making conclusions and conclusions and conclusions. As you conclude, you become less and less alive. You know, there is that famous parable uh, which is all over the place about Adam and Eve. It seems uh, God told them, it's a dumb couple. Kind of. Look at what we had to suffer as a result of them. <laughs> no, no, not because of that, because they didn't know what to do with each other <laughs> So, God told them, you eat whatever you want, but don't eat from this particular tree. You know what tree that was? No, apple means in old English just a fruit. What knowledge? Your parents tell you, you must eat the fruit of knowledge, your teachers insist that you must eat the fruit of knowledge. Everybody in the society always trying to shove knowledge down your throat, but it, it seems God told you not to eat the fruit of knowledge and by eating that, that Adam and Eve fell. It is not about that Adam and that Eve, it's about every Adam and every Eve. The moment you eat the fruit of knowledge, you fall because your idea of a knowledge is the conclusions that you make about everything in the universe. Thank <laughs> you.